Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to the Florida State University College of Law, Black Alumni Network, BAN TV, our monthly series, online conversations with some of our featured alumni, our community partners. We welcome you to this conversation. We want you to join the chat right below. Uh, my name is Marlon Hill. I'm a proud graduate of the Florida State University College of Law, 1995, and host of BAN TV. And we hope that everyone is settling into the holiday season. This is our second episode, um, our last episode last month. We interviewed our president, Celicia Gordon-Smith, um, who introduced the BAN Alumni, Black Alumni Network, talked about our vision, talked about the importance of the Florida State College of Law. This month, we have an exciting episode to welcome one of our esteemed alumni. Um, he is a graduate of Florida State um, University College of Law in 1994, um, the CEO of the Pittman Law Group, representing Fortune 500 companies, nonprofit organizations, um, healthcare institutions, primarily within the realm of state and local government. I um, want to welcome attorney Sean Pittman to Ban TV. He is live on the streets of government. Uh, he's probably listening to some live city commission or county commission meeting now. The legislative session is not in session yet until January 12th, thereabouts. Um, but he is here, Ban TV. We want to welcome him, brother Sean Pittman. You're on the mute, Mac. We got we gotta get our tech here. No, nope, that was on me. She told me not to touch anything, and I touched it anyway. <laughs> uh, hey, congratulations on what you're doing. Thank you uh, for uh, getting for doing what you're doing, man. I mean, this is rare. This is new, uh, and what a what a great branding opportunity for a great school. And for you know some alums that do great things, so I I don't know why I'm early in the in the process of this. Maybe it's just let me get you out of the way. <laughs> I'm okay with that too. But uh, but man, uh, what a tribute to the amazing people that have come through uh, Florida State University College of Law. And yeah, absolutely, there's, man. there's an abundant abundant uh, list of folks from you to go from. So this is a great show. Because you're never going to run out of, of guessing content. <laughs> endless, 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 endless. But listen, man, we've been practicing law now for 26 years. Um, we, we, we make a living and make a contribution to the greater community, courtesy of the Florida State University College of Law, um, being one of the many um, Black law students who went through the, um, through the program there. So we're going to talk about a little bit about our law school experience. We're going to talk a little bit about life in general and um, but today's topic, though, for Band TV is building a legacy in law and politics. And there's no one better that we could have chosen than our FSU Law um, Band um, colleague, Sean Pittman. So, Sean, you know, we've got to go back a little bit before folks know you as um, the CEO of your own um, law firm and, and the things that you're doing presently. You know, you, you know the, the, the social media picture, how it started. And then we're going to come back to how it's going. So we need to go back to how it started. So for the folks who may be tuning in to Ban TV for the first time and, and, and you know, tuning into this conversation, take us back a little bit. Who's Sean Pittman? Tell us a little bit about your personal background and your family um, and, and how it started. Yeah, that's a long story because I'm, I'm old as crap. But, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, most people, I'm glad you asked the question because most people don't don't know that story, right? And uh, I, 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 I never asked it, um, seldom asked it, so I don't get to tell it too much. And, you know, my kids are, are, are busy um, enjoying uh, being our kids, so they don't get to hear that either because it's not, it's not all the good news that they're used to every day. So I, I, try, to, I try to keep them in their present uh, so I don't always get to talk about the past. But, you know, look, I'm from a, a little city in Palm Beach County uh, called Riviera Beach. Uh, we call it the Raw. And uh, it's adjacent, it's it's right across um, east from Bell Glade, Pahokee, and South Bay. And uh, that's called the Muck. Mm. And 
everything in between and east of Riviera Beach are all things that were uh, that that we were not allowed to to experience as kids when I was growing up. So um, if you are from any anywhere like Overtown, if you're from uh, Richmond Heights, if you're from uh, um, Ocala, a little place in Ocala that I, I forget the name of it, but if you're from French yeah. Town or any of those cities where um, our that are predominantly black and our and and you have all the wrong all the wrong lows and all the wrong highs when you talk about percentages of, of poverty and 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 education and and work and unemployment. Uh, we experienced all of that. Mm. And uh, so growing up there uh, was uh, an interesting thing for me. And, just, you know, I went to schools in Riviera Beach and graduated from Riviera Beach and got out of Riviera Beach. And so tell me, so tell me, Sean, what did you learn as a kid in the raw or the muck? What, what lessons did you did you grow up with in, that you, you cont that continues to resonate today? You know, I, I think I learned that you that you have to that you can rise above, rise above your circumstances, mm -hmm. right? I mean, uh, we didn't get to see it much, but it gave some of us the opportunity and the will to to be uh, one of the first. You know, we had a lot of people come out of that area in sports. We championed um, those people who came out of the raw and the muck that went on to do great things in colleges and sports and, and NFL, NBA and beyond. Um, so, so we were known for that, still known for that. Uh, but uh, for someone like me, that that was never going to be my thing. Uh, not in any way that, that, that I could convince anybody of, uh, I, I needed to find another way. Right. So, uh, while I, I, I got to tell you, I, I do a lot of work in Riviera Beach now, and it's it's so different than it was. Um, you see people in Riviera Beach trying to lift people to the point where they can get out and come back to contribute. You see the, the city really uh, focusing in on its attributes and its benefits and trying to work together to to have the, the potential realized. Uh, so it's still very much a small a small city but it's a small city with huge opportunity mm -hmm. and, and I'm happy to be from there and I can tell you right now I would not be as ambitious as I am would not have achieved what I've achieved without the lessons that I learned in, in Riviera Beach and it's what was your nickname what, 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 what was your nickname in the monk in the in the raw I had several <laughs> <laughs> and we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about any of them, uh, but I grew up in a place called Broadmoor. Okay, some low income housing right there on the main strip, uh, uh, Blue Heron Boulevard. And look, every kid there had a nickname. It had a few of them, and they transcended. We all went to junior high school right behind where we grew up. Okay. So, so your nickname not only left where you. The, the the complex where you lived it went into the junior high school and circulated throughout uh the city so you right. were known for whatever you're known for so uh but i i ended well because uh my nickname when i ended was was shawnee p which is fine because that's my name <laughs> for the other nicknames you will have to go to wikipedia so so, <laughs> so before you left the raw what 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 precipitated the decision to head to Tallahassee to Florida State University to pursue undergraduate studies? Tell us about that transition. How did that happen? Uh, you know, I I was familiar with Tallahassee because um, I had a a brother who uh, was living there uh, for some time. My mother went to FAMU, um, so I was familiar with Tallahassee. So it was something that I was easily gravitating to. Um, but I have to tell you, I was a, I played basketball in high school and I was planning to go off and, and just on scholarship to play basketball. And I had opportunities to do that at um, some HBCUs 
and some community colleges all over the country. I mean, the name names I can't even repeat. Wasn't a lot, Marlon, but yeah. a few were in places I can't even repeat. And I had a math teacher who actually just passed earlier this year, who really, really changed my trajectory uh, and, and sat down with me one day and, and actually talked me out of it and said, you know what, you really ought to, if you can go to a four-year school and I see that there's two that you can go to, you ought to do that. Yeah. You know, try out for basketball there, but you've already told me that you're not, you don't think you're going to the NBA. So go ahead and focus on those things that might have longevity for you. And it's, it's been some of the best advice I got. And uh, I always appreciated him for that. His, his, his name was Charles Teague. And uh, uh, I always appreciate him for that. So did you have a vision for yourself when you decided to go to Florida State? What did you want to study there? Um, did it did it work out as you planned it? And how was that transition? No, I, mean, I was like one. I, I was still one of those kids that 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 came because people because, you know, people thought you should go. Uh, I, I didn't have anything else to do. And I was I did well enough in high school that I had that option. Um, look, look, I still wanted to be a, a, the first basketball player, NBA player who had a recording deal, right? Sure, so, Sean P. That's right. So, so when I when I came to college, the basketball thing was no longer possible, but you know the music thing was still possible. Uh, so I, I I spent a year actually uh, pursuing that, um, and then I learned that when you go to music in college that it is different right <laughs> and it is some of the hardest thing you could ever want to do uh is in, in florida state by the way music school is top no, was top at the, time, the top in the country yeah. and probably still very competitive and i watched people in my first semester at at florida state as a law as a music major i saw people uh grinding spending the night on the floor uh outside of, of a rehearsal room uh I, I just never seen people i marlon i didn't see people work that hard in law school music school is a very very competitive place and uh, I, I i it only took me about a semester to know that that wasn't that wasn't that so, was my, so, so you made the so transition up, all my dreams were done <laughs> so you made the transition from music too well i well i i just at that point i was like you know, basketball's not working, music's not working, but you know what? I was senior class president in high school. So maybe I ought to go, you know, get involved in leadership and maybe political science is my thing. And, and, and that's what I did. I, I, I trans, I, you know, I sort of changed everything and start focusing in on, on, government and um, um, political science and public administration and student government became my friend and my fraternity. Uh, I mean, it, it all sort of worked out in the way that it was that it was supposed to. And uh, that's history. You know, I got to I got to thank basketball and music for giving you giving us the gift of Sean Pittman in student government because you were one of my senators on campus. <laughs> that, that That's yeah. my my, my vivid memory of you in that role. How did you get involved with that? I mean, and what what did you learn from that 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 you think influenced where you are now? What what, what did you learn from that experience? A campus, forty thousand people that 90 percent don't look like you and me. What was that like in terms of the leadership opportunity for that experience? Yeah, you know, Marlon, it was. You know, everybody has read what that's like, right? I mean, it, it you can read it, um, but it's hard to really know what it's like unless you are sitting in the classroom and you're the only one that look like yourself and you are a student senator and there's 80 of you and two only two look like you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, what what it was like was heavy. You know, it was very heavy. It was you know, how do you represent what's not there in every single aspect? And while you're doing that, how do you contribute to the things that have nothing to do with any of that? Um, because you're so pigeonholed in the, in the, in the, 
the things that you have to fight for because you're the only one there to do it. Um, I, you know, there were a lot of challenges with that particular scenario, but I can tell you that that student government and, and Florida State changed my life. I mean, I became, uh, you know, talk about reinventing yourself. I got a chance to face fears. I got a chance to to walk out on planks. I, you know, I got a chance to um, go toe to toe with 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 people who would never think that I have any value proposition for anything that we're talking about or doing. Right. And and most of the time I came out where I deserved to be. And that wasn't always winning. Sometimes it, it was a loss because I deserved to lose. Um, so, but there, you know, obviously there's lessons to be learned in every single one of those scenarios. So I, I, much like you, Marlon, I mean, you were there, you were around, you asked the question, knowing the answer. Um, but who would we be, you know, without those challenges? Yeah. So are you telling me that there's politics on a college campus? Uh, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> I'm not telling you that. You already know that. <laughs> but so what, so what kind of politics did you have to deal with, and and what what kind of lessons did you learn from 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 those 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 battles? Well, student government is interesting because it's a party system, right? Um, you, if you come in and you don't meet the right people, you end up on the wrong side. It could take you years to realize some of those dreams you may have had, like being really involved in student government, being elected to something, um, actually being able to contribute to, you know, to grow in student government to the point where you become student body president. I yeah. mean, uh, people ask me all the time, like, how did you become student body president uh, of a predominantly white campus? I was like, you know what? I can't take all the credit. Part of it was I ended up, I started in the right places where I could learn enough to, to be able to identify, you know, who are the people moving in the right direction? Who are the people who have the resources to make, to make, to get across campus? You know, what were some of those places? Well, I mean, to back up, what did I say that made you ask that? <laughs> that in turn, you said that you, you, you had to be in the right places. You know, oh, you like you had to, run. absolutely. You look, you could meet somebody, there's two or three parties on campus. Mm -hmm. If you meet somebody uh, like you, you're a Kappa. If you had met somebody that was a Sigma or an Alpha, you probably would have, or Q, you've been in the wrong place. Th my point is, if you met somebody that was in the party in control, you had a better chance at uh, access to getting in office or at least access to seeing what it takes to get in office because the parties didn't stay around very long, two or three years, if you're lucky. But I got on campus and by the grace of God, I ended up with, I ended up meeting people who were a part of the party that was in control. And that's what put me in position to be elected as a student Senator. And once I got elected as a student Senator, I was able to learn what I needed to learn to maneuver myself. But right. if you just come in and you end up on a, in a place for a party that's about to lose or that actually loses, you could end up in that wrong side for a long time. You know, you know, you, you know, after, after being elected student body president, you know, you, you started this path on, on, on political science. Um, what was the next big decision that you had to make after you were done with your term as student body president? Um, was law school in the horizon or what, what were you thinking you were going to do next at that time? Yeah. Remember in all that we've talked about, I've never said that I wanted to be a lawyer. Right. Uh, because that was never the case. Right. Um, what got me there was, you know, my time in student government, um, uh, when I was student body president, I was, uh, I decided, you know, how do I, I was making all these connections, you know, I was traveling, I was meeting FSU alum, and I was on boards where the, where professors and FSU alum, whether they're business people or politicians, whatever they were, um, I always collect their business cards. It's different today. Most people don't travel around with many business cards anymore. Uh, cause so much stuff is digital, but then business cards were the thing. Right. 
and I kept them all. And so one day during the Christmas holiday, I decided, I, okay, who have you met? And I laid out all the cards, Mar Marlon. And there must have been hundreds of them, probably 150 of them, right? Right. And 73% of them were lawyers. That's how I ended up in law school. Wow. I said to myself, if you're going to really, if networking is real, and if you're going to utilize a, a portion of these relationships, you got to get what they got. And I started studying for the LSAT and I decided wow. to go to law school. That's awesome, how I got awesome. it. Everybody's got their own story. And how did you settle up? How did you settle in Florida State? Well, because I wasn't quite ready, I didn't think I was quite ready. Um, it had been, you know, after being student by president, man, it's just so busy, it's so tough. And I thought um, that I needed to leave Tallahassee. So my goal was to leave and I was going to go to law school at Florida. And I decided, I know, I'm sorry, but a lot of, but a lot of Seminoles do it. Yeah. I know. A lot of them do undergrad at FSU, go to law school in Florida, and they're still great knows. So it's it, I, I've not seen Florida take any one of them away from us. And I was headed down that path. And then um, FSU um, said they would defer my acceptance for a year. Mm. And that did it for me. I wow. was like, okay, I'm going to FSU. Which gave you know, me time to get away, which gave, gave me time to detach from the things that might have been distracting, because uh, that was the only reason I was going to leave. Right. I, you know, you know, being a Kappa, finishing, you know, leaving as student body president, it's just too much. It was just too much uh, potential distraction for going into law school. And so I needed to start new. So I, I, I explained that and they, the, the solution was, hey, take a year off right. and then come back. And that's what I did. And for the and for the viewers who who may not be um, fully knowledgeable of the the, the full name, it's the Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, right? So that that was an important part of your experience um, at Florida State. Absolutely. Wasn't it? Absolutely. So, did you know the history of Florida State University's College of Law at that time? I did not. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and and I don't. All, I don't know all of what your question means, but but the, but the answer to any level of that question is no. No, um, I, it was not. In terms a, of the connection between Florida State and Florida A and M, and yes, I didn't know that until I was appointed to the Board of Regents by Governor Childs, and it became an issue because it was the time when FAMU was trying to get their law school back. And so as a member of the Board of Regents, they had to come through me, right. and the 12 other members. And so that's when I that, that was the time when I got really educated on on what we were talking about, what we what had happened and, and that I realized that, you know, the, the FAMU Law School had never been taken off out of statute. It still existed. It was just never funded mm -hmm. anymore. The, the funds were revert were, you know, transferred to Florida State to to start their law school. Right. So, so were you appointed were you appointed to the Board of Regents when you were in law school or um before you left Florida State undergrad? When I was in law school. Law school. Okay. So you continue to build that legacy in law and politics. So during law school you're serving on the Board of Regents. And for those folks who may not understand otherwise known now as the Board of Trustees for the State of Education. Board of Governors. Board of, board of Governors. Governors. But, yeah. Right. And how did you juggle that and law school? I mean, what was that experience like? Well, <laughs> I didn't juggle it very well because <laughs> after I left law school, they they started making people swipe their badges to to, to attend classes. Uh, it was a great experience. I mean, any any gubernatorial appointment is significant, but to be to sit on the board that governs the state university system was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I learned more than I deserve to learn at the time. And you just mentioned one of the things, I mean, the, the FAMU law school stuff, which I got a chance to vote on, um, um, FAMU getting their, their law school back and, and, you know, in Orlando 
FIU getting a law school, uh, the new university, Florida, uh, Florida Gulf University. That was new at the time. I got a chance to vote on that as well. Um, just really, really huge and significant things that 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 changes a system. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great. And I couldn't have done it, obviously, the first year of law school, but I, I, I had the opportunity to do it the second year of law school and um, in, in well into the third year of law school. So it was a it was an eye opening experience. And again, every, a great percentage of the people that I met and was networking with were lawyers. So they got added to that list. <laughs> you know, you know, Sean, um, you know, many people don't know that, you know, in law school, we're, st we're still relatively young people in our 20s. Some of our law school classmates, early 30s. You know, how, how would you describe your law school experience at Florida State? And, and for those young people out there that are considering law school or who may even be in law school right now, you know, what, do, what did you learn about law student Sean? You know, it was, a, it, it was a different time again, which, by the way, you were you were there. So, you know, and law schools were doing something very interesting. They had shifted to deciding that they didn't want to waste law school uh, education on people who didn't know that's what they wanted to do. So I don't know. I don't know if you have looked at your law school class, but my law school class had a lot of folks that were in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, and even a couple guys in their 60s. Mm. And there were very few of us, particularly African-Americans, that were in our 20s, right? Right. And, and uh, so that was a weird time. Transition to today, or at some point shifted back to young people having real opportunities to go to law school. But during our day, young people getting turned down uh, I mean, it was unbelievable what we were hearing. And I only know that because I was, again, on the Board of Regents, and that was part of the dialogue I was understanding. And and particularly, it was a great argument for FAMU in trying to get their school back. Um, but I tell you, law school was a, one of the best experiences of my life. And it was because it, I, it, it got me back in a place where there was real competitiveness law students are competitive whether you want to be or you don't want to be you 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 just are you're competitive as it relates to who can find the best um, information um, who can find it fast enough who can who can uh, um, um, sound more like a lawyer <laughs> in class uh, you know who can get the best job uh, you know who has the best political contacts I mean all, keep going you can go all day yeah a very competitive place. I love it. Absolutely. Did you, did you, um, did you, after getting past your fundamentals, you know, the legal writing and, you know, the constitutional law, did you curate the, the choice of choices of courses to continue building this legacy of law and politics, administrative law, um, legislative? Did you pick courses that would push you in that direction or? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, again, I, you know, my path has been trying to penetrate things that, you know, that we don't have a large footprint in. And so when I was in law school, I didn't it, it I didn't gravitate towards criminal law. I didn't gravitate towards civil law. I didn't gravitate towards those things that we had a lot of representation in. I sort of gravitated towards the thing that we needed representation in. Mm. And you know, and I, I liken it to, you know, the the story about um, in short form, form where, you know, there was a village where people kept falling off the uh, falling off the ledge into the valley. And this kept going on where and then the town people said, well, since people keep falling off the ledge into the valley, why don't we just put an ambulance in the valley? to pick, be able to pick them up when they fall, you know, but then somebody else was like, well, wait, why don't we just put a fence up on the, on the ledge to stop them from falling in the valley? So I always find myself um, the person that wants to put the fence up, right? Because I think we got enough people that are ready 
when they fall in the valley to, 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 right. to get them, to grab them, to, to take care of them, to revive them or to, or to <laughs> dig them a ditch, right? Or a grave, but not enough of us that are trying to build the fence to make sure that there aren't laws passed that put us in the valley. So it's, sure the sum of, it's, it's the sum of 1994. Yeah. Take us back a little bit. Um, are you getting ready for the bar? How did you do that? W what was that transition from? Were you going to uh, go into the private world? Were you going to go into public sector? Yeah, yeah. So that was interesting for me because before I left law school, I got a call from the governor's office uh, to come and work for the governor in his reelection campaign. So I put off taking the bar because, you know, a month before I left school, I'm traveling with the governor, um, helping him get reelected. So 1994 is a reelection year. 1994 is a reelection year. Interesting. OK. Yeah. And um, so that's what I did. And that trans that translated into me working for him for another year. And, you know, who gets that? Who from Riviera Beach gets that opportunity? You know, so, listen, you know, so Governor Childs was known for driving around the state in a truck, right? So, <laughs> so did you take his truck to the muck or to the raw? So that I'll tell you that that's an interesting question. When I when I met with him, he didn't say very much. The meeting lasted less than 10 minutes. <laughs> his first question was, well, it wasn't a question. He said, you know, you did a great job on the Board of Regents. He said, he said, you're doing a great job on the Board of Regents. And I thanked him for the appointment. He said, you know, I grew up at a different, in a different time. He said, I grew up in Polk County and I grew up in a different time. Things are different now than they were then. And I realized that people don't change that much. And that's why I need people like you around me to make sure that I understand that times are different. He said, thanks for coming. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. That was it. That was my interview. That was my acceptance of the role. And that led to, you know, he and I becoming pretty decent friends. Uh, well, the friendship must have been pretty good, Sean, because he did get reelected in 1994 yeah. um, for, for another term. And, um, so did you go and work for his office after he got reelected? I went and worked for him. And then shortly after, shortly in the in the second term as governor, he brought a guy down from D.C. that had been his chief of staff because uh, the, the Department of Business and Perfection Regulation was out of whack. And he brought this guy down to be the secretary. And he called me in his office one day and he said, hey, uh, I need you. You're a lawyer about to be a lawyer. I need, <laughs> I need you to go over there and work with Rick and I need y'all to blow it up and I need you to redo it. And that's what we did. What department was that? Department of Business and Professional Regulation. Uh, yeah. We took uh, it apart and we put it back together. And, and, and that's the department that certifies law firms like yours now. No, actually, well, it does everything but law firms and, and medical and doctors, right? It does everything else. So it was very, very significant. And, and Marlon is how I got into administrative law okay. because that's most of my practice was before them. Right. <laughs> so, so it was a net, it was a natural transition when I finished there uh, to go into the, into administrative work. So when did Pittman Law Group, when was that born? Well, you're celebrating your 20th anniversary, so. Yep, 2001. So after I left the Department of Business Professional Regulation, John Thrasher hired me over in the House of Representatives as a staff attorney, and uh, which is where I got that piece of my work, uh, it is a crash course in a Republican legislature mm -hmm. uh, and uh, putting that with the work that I had done in the executive branch, I was ready uh, to start my firm and use the, you know, the, the administrative know-how to use the statutory, um, uh, the, 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 the government law and statutory interpretation um, expertise that I had developed 
and uh, and the relationships that I've made over that period of time uh, to start a firm. And, uh, and here, 20 years later, we're still here. Well, 20 years later, Sean, um, there's a lot that has happened in Florida politics um, over that time since Lawton Childs, you know, Jeb Bush, Charlie Crist, um, Ron DeSantis. Uh, the, the legislature has changed back and forth. Um, presidents have won, presidents have lost uh, over the last 20 years. Learned about Florida politics. You know, the legislature is two blocks away from the law school that it, that, and two blocks away from the university that that basically raised you. Um, how would you describe Florida politics then, and how would you define it now? Wow, that's a that's a good question. That's a difficult question to answer. I I would say this. I I, I think then. Um, I think politics then would be described as um, was it as tense? It, it well, it was absolutely as tense. But 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 I think what 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 I saw when I got really active and that I was paying attention was we were in a similar time as now right with redistricting and 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 the changing of lines and and party in control having to make decisions about sacrificing uh, their own membership right in order to draw fair lines and you know when i when you talk about the mid 90s because that's what we're talking about i'm talking about democrats being in control and you're talking about and you start talking about black Democrats deciding that they want more minority access seats. And you then have you then you then you you got Democrats in control of it all having to decide how do they satisfy their 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 major base that's saying we want to be reflective of what we bring to the party. And so I think the Democrats in the mid nineties had a, uh, they had a, a, a tough decision to make. If they did what the black Democrats were asking, they would have to draw lines and pit themselves up against some of those black <laughs> in those minority access districts. Right. So they would, so they, they, they had to make a decision to keep things in a way that the democratic party could still be dominant in the state, but that's not the choice they made. What, what they did in turn was decided, well, I want to keep my seat. You want to keep your seat. So let's just create these super, super duper black districts so you can get more black people. But what they did in, 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 in doing that was they made the they made the party registrations in the white districts right thin. Mm. So here's what happened then. What they could not have known was a few years later, there was going to come term limitations. So you put all that together. So as long as they were in, had the 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 as long as they had the um, fruits of incumbency, they still won their seats. Democrats were still in control. But when term limitations came into play, right, start falling off mm. because the registrations were very close, right? So so that was in my mind, that's that sticks in my mind all the time when I think about the 90s and politics in Florida. And so when that, the Pittman Law Group started. Well, Pittman Law Group started in 2001 under Republican regime, mm -hmm. right? But I was getting my stripes with Democrats. I mean, I, I interned for uh, um, Peter Rudy Wallace, who was the Speaker of the House, the last Democratic Speaker of the House, right? I mean, you. this was a time, and that was a time when we saw the, the Republicans have 20, 20, 20 Democrats, 20 Republicans, right? And they had to switch off with having a president being a Democrat, the last Democrat president, and then your your guy from uh, um, Broward County, Jim Scott, the first Republican 
uh, Senate president that had a dual role. So the, it was it was an interesting time. Mm -hmm. I actually see this time being very similar in that it's a pivotal political time where we've gone now 20 years, 20 something odd years, 24 years of a party being able to pass laws and to be able to shape the state in a way that actually benefits their um, benefits their reign. Right. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I, I, I think Democrats did it too, right? I mean, I mean, everybody does it, but it's interesting. So what I keep watching for is when is that 90s moment for our time? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know whether ha whether it happens. The Republicans maybe you know, but but that 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 sense of imploding is always on the. I, I just keep looking for it. Now, right. I haven't seen it yet, not to the degree that it has changed, because the other thing is your 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 opponent has got to recognize it as well, and they've got to do strategy wise what they need to do to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. One of the things you saw in the '90s where the Republicans were a lot of the they were they were creating a bench in local government. So you saw your mayors and your city commission, they were building a bench so that when term limitations came about, they had people that were ready with resumes, with track records. And we didn't, we didn't do well. Right. And I say we, I was young then, right. <laughs> but I'm just trying to take some, uh, make it wholesome, right? We all involved, but we didn't, we didn't build a bench like we should have. How different was it walking into the student government chambers as opposed to the capital chambers? Was there any difference in terms of the dynamics of what you needed to do to be successful in either chamber? Well, I, I, here's, here's how I would answer that for you. I don't think I knew it at the time, Okay, but the dynamics are the same and actually so are the people. Mm. And the latter is the most important part of that. Right. When Dean Cannon was student by when Dean Cannon was student by president at Florida, I was at I was student by president at FSU. Florida City. Right. Um you run across people, all these people that you work with in student governments, right, you end up seeing them again and they end up in powerful places. You, end up in, you may end up in a powerful place. So um, and, and I assume it's like that in other states as well. But in Florida, if you are in student government at one of the major universities in the state of Florida, the likelihood you are likely there with a future governor, a future speaker, a future president. Yeah. And I tell students all the time that be careful, you know, really watch out how you deal with people. Right. You think it doesn't mean anything. And it actually does. So, Sean, tell me, what for, for folks, the law student or even the person that's not connected to law, what do they need to understand about what happens at the Capitol in Tallahassee that they're not, they, they really should understand, but they don't? You know, whether you want to answer that question through the eyes as a CEO of a law firm that represents institutions and companies before the legislature or just regular community leaders, what do we need to understand about what happens in Tallahassee that's impacting what happens in your city or your county or your homeowners association? It's all connected. It's all connected, Marlon, even if you don't know it. The decisions that are being made in Tallahassee and in chambers across this state are impacting you whether you know it or not. So when you walk into that booth or you decide not to walk in that booth, you are making a decision whether to have an impact on your own life. And listen, the popularity contest is in high school. The popularity contest is in, in, in some, so some respects in college. Yeah. But the people you send to Tallahassee, you need to know that they understand that your interest is in their hands. And in some instances, and in most instances, your life. I mean, look, when we say show up and vote like your life depends on it, that's not just a cliche. Mm -hmm. it, it, the quality of your life really does depend on it. 
And and by the way, I I work with these people. Most of them really, really want to do a great job. Most of them really believe that they can make a difference. And most of them are really, really in Tallahassee trying to go back home with something better. They, they do. But what they need more than anything else is to be held accountable. Right. They need you to do that. And they so want you to do that. We're coming down to the, we're coming down to the wire. And I, and I, and I want to ask you um, a, a couple more questions. Um, when does someone call Sean Pittman? And why? Someone <laughs> that someone could be the CEO or it could yeah. be an individual or it could be. Tell us a little bit about um, Pittman Law Group. Well, it, it, what, so, what do you guys so, actually do yeah. on behalf of your clients? So so what we have created and we're very, very proud of it. What we have created is a statewide firm in the third largest state in the country of people who look like me and you who can do big, big things. So. We represent local governments. We represent um, Fortune 500 companies. We represent uh, CRAs. We represent uh, folks, uh, um, local governments involved in redistricting. Um, I mean, we and we haven't seen that before, right? We mm -hmm. and and here's the other thing: we represent business interests. You know, women and minorities are founding more businesses, are, are going after tax credits, um, they're, they're going after grants, they're doing very complicated things that we've never done before. And they need a place to go for people who can help them, who understand how to get it done and can lead them in the right direction. So now, I, now Sean Pittman gets all kind of calls. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it because when you I branded, I've worked hard to brand myself in a way that I'm a problem solver. Right. So people come to me for a number of things. And, you know, we've got six lawyers in the firm. And if we can't handle it, we we got a network of people that can handle it. We try not to deal with something that we're not versed in. But at the end of the day, our firm holds itself out to be a problem solver. So no matter who you are, what you are, what you what problem you have, you can come to us and we and we can tell you, you know, um, either we can do it or we can help you order your steps. Right. And 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 that's 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 vitally important for our people right now. You know, Sean, we're we're so proud to have you as a part of this law school community and this band family, this black alumni network that started um, this year, um, but when you're not solving problems or when you're not um, traveling between cities and keeping up with um, your three daughters and, and Audra, um, you're having fun on, on radio and your podcast. Tell us a little bit about the things that um, you're doing outside the law office and tell us a little bit about this radio program and this podcast that you, you started this year during the pandemic. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I'll try to keep it short. I started the podcast because I was trying to figure out how I bring together all the things that I'm doing. You know, how do I bring together my work in Leadership Florida? How do I bring together my work with Orange Bowl Committee or the National Bar Association or with my wife and the Savannah College of Art and Design or through the, the, the huge legal um, fights and battles that we're having at the Capitol? And, and, and so I was trying to figure out how do I bring all that together? Because 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 not everything you can monetize. Right. Um, some things, you know, I, I know 50 athletic directors across the country. There's no way to monetize that. But there is a way to bring it into something that's important. And that's where the podcast came in. I wanted to figure out how when I'm doing all these 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 things and meeting all these people, how do I bring that home to my community, my friends? Um, the people who would listen to it from me. And that's where the podcast came from. That's and awesome. It's been amazing. It's been amazing. Well, no, no, no Sunday. Not as this show. It's not as good as this show. And the host is not as great. It's this you know, one. no Sunday, no Sunday past me at 9 30 a.m. for the Sean Pittman show. But Sean, we both serve on the Orange Bowl committee together. You're not the president anymore. No. So Stephen A. Smith would ask you, we have the playoffs coming up. 
semifinals have been picked, right? We have one, two, three, and four. In the Orange Bowl, we have Michigan and Georgia. In the Cotton Bowl, we have Alabama and Cincinnati. You're on the clock. What's your pick? We're going to see Alabama and Georgia for a rematch in Indy. Ah, Alabama and Georgia for a rematch. I think that's what we're going to see. And you're putting that on the Seminole Gaming app? I am. I am. <laughs> and then listen, by the way, I, you, you didn't ask me my preference. You just asked me what I think. Yeah. Right? And and listen, here's the thing. I think I think Cincinnati, I, I've, I've, I've loved their year. Um, I wanted them there because it's just time for something different and something new. I don't know their I don't know that they have met the grown ass men <laughs> they're about to meet, okay, in Dallas in, that that will be wearing the big A. Uh, that that so it so it depends on how they are going to handle that, right? Okay. That period. And for the Orange Bowl, our bowl, let me tell you. I would not want to be the team that has to play Georgia after Georgia lost to Alabama. Mm. Those very talented guys are hurt and they got something to prove. Mm. I would not want to be the team that has to play them. That's where my, uh, that's where my picks are coming from. And by the way, I, I like Michigan. I got friends on, I got friends with kids on Michigan I'm not a fan of Harbaugh, Harbaugh, but uh, 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 but Orange Bowl we're neutral. <laughs> but I, I just I don't think they're going to be ready for uh, the Georgia that we have. If the Georgia that we have seen this season anything like them shows up, Michigan's got to bring something entirely different. Well, listen, man, we want to thank you for your leadership and your example, and and, and just being a, a source of inspiration from the law school community. Um, there, there are lots of legions of all the lawyers and um, legislative staff and external affairs directors that have um, learned from your example. And we, we just appreciate you being a part of this network. And, you know, thank you for coming on as our second episode for the Band TV. Um, look forward to the next episode of the Sean Pittman Show every Sunday, 9.30 p.m., where can they find the podcast and the show again, Sean? Yeah, so the podcast on on all the all the mediums, right? Um, Spotify, Apple, um, and a couple others I can't remember. But if you're inclined on Sunday morning, you can just go to TuneIn or or uh, iHeart uh, the radio apps and listen to it live. Uh, but uh, if but if you got other stuff to do, do that because you know <laughs> we have fun, but you might not. If we have a guest that you're interested in, then do it. And I tell you, go. Which it, it, I, what you should do is is go back and check out some of the shows. Yeah. Um, the young lady I had last week, Camille Brown, unbelievable young lady who uh, just broke barriers at the Metropolitan Opera in New York uh, with this uh, play about the memoirs of Charles Blow, famous mm -hmm. journalist Charles Blow. Uh, Fire shut up in my bones, and. Uh, I enjoyed talking to her. She was amazing. Check that show out. Absolutely. Uh, but Marlon, let me say this. I love this, what you're doing. And not because, and listen, I'm glad I'm early because the other shows that you could have are going to be absolutely phenomenal because the graduates from floor, from this law school, the, the list of um, people doing amazing things, yeah. they have the same degree that you and I have, including you. Uh, is long and is vast, and I hope you are able to get them all on the show. I will certainly be watching, and so Absolutely. Uh, please keep doing this. Absolutely. Everyone, thank you for tuning in to Band TV, Florida State University College of Law, Black Alumni Work Work. You are listening to Sean Pittman, CEO of the Pittman Law Group. Check him out at pittman-law.com. We look forward to seeing you at the second Wednesday of January. Please have a healthy and safe holiday season, Christmas season, Kwanzaa, and a happy new year for 2022. We will see you on the second Wednesday of January for our third episode of Band TV. See you then.